is risen. Amen. Please stand and celebrate that with us today.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. For those watching at home, good morning to you as well. We hope that you're having a great start to a great day. I am convinced today is by far the best day of every year, okay? Easter Sunday is my favorite one. And not having been able to celebrate with everybody last year and being able to do it today is just awesome. Just awesome. Good to see everybody. And uh, welcome uh, again for those of you who are at home. You know what? Today we celebrate the freedom uh, that Christ has given to us because he rose from the dead. And so... Our theme for the day is that there's no denying that Jesus is alive, okay? And you're going to hear throughout the service some people say why they think there's no denying that Jesus is alive. And so that's why I want you to be thinking about that question yourself, okay? Why do you believe that Jesus is alive? I'm going to say this. I think there's no denying that Jesus is alive because today all over the planet, people are celebrating the same thing. People are celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ died, but he came back to life. To me, that just shows that there is power, okay? That Jesus is powerful and he is alive, and that's why we've come to celebrate today. So um, we're going to let you stand today if you'd like. If you'd rather sit down, that's fine. But if you'd like to stand and just sing, uh, sing your hearts out, okay? Because we're praising a living, sa living Savior today. Let's praise. Dawning of hope in Jerusalem, fold in the grave clothes, tomb filled with light as the angels announce Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan brought in love, born in pain, paid in sacrifice, fulfilled in Christ the man. Christ is risen from the dead. See Mary weeping, where is he laid? As in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb. Here's a voice speaking, calling her name. It's the Master, the Lord, raised to life. That spans the years, speaking life, stirring hope, bringing peace to us. Will sound till he appears, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. One with the Father, ancient of days. Through the Spirit who glows, space with certainty, honor and blessing, glory and praise to the King, crowned with power and authority. And we are raised with Him. Death is dead, love is one, Christ is conquered. And we shall reign with Him, for He lives. Christ is risen from the dead. And we are raised with him. Death is dead. Love is one. Christ is conquered. And we shall reign with him. For he lives. Christ is risen from the dead. And we shall reign with him. For he lives. Christ is risen from the dead. Christ the Lord is risen to
there's no denying that Jesus is alive for me because I've seen him change impossible situations time and again with no reasonable explanation. I believe in the risen one. I, I believe I overcome by the power To everything, there is a season, a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to be born. and a time to die. Death is inevitable, and when it comes, it's the end. But there's this one story that I keep coming back to, the story of Jesus. Christians say he rose from the dead. He seemed like a good man, even a great man, but how could this be true? People don't rise from the dead after crucifixion, yet there's something about him, something about this Jesus that keeps pulling me back, drawing me in. I want to believe, but it seems impossible. It seems irrational. It 
seems like it's all smoke and mirrors. Tricks. Fantasies. Fabrications and lies. His first followers built a whole religion around believing Jesus was a dead man walking. It must be some sort of magic trick. He couldn't really be God, could he? At least Christians have something to hold on to, something to believe in. Maybe I'm envious of that. Maybe I want to be. But there is a God, and a dead man could be raised. Maybe I could have that kind of life that Jesus talked about. I want to believe in something, but I can't. Just can't be possible. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Or is the entire church just smoke and mirrors? a little different way to start an Easter message, wasn't it? I wanted to show that video, though, because I know that there are a lot of people who do view the resurrection of Jesus as really nothing more than smoke and mirrors. And perhaps some of you are listening today or listening to this, and if that's the case, I'm really excited, okay, uh, that you're here or you're listening. Because trying to make sense of a story that says that a God became a man who then died, who then came back to life, is really hard to put our arms around and hard to believe. But we're here today because there's really no denying, okay, at least in so many people's minds, that Jesus is alive. Even though he died one of the most gruesome deaths that has ever been known to mankind, God didn't use smoke and mirrors. What he did was he had this plan from even before time began here on earth that Jesus executed to perfection. I hope if you're skeptical today, okay, whether you're, you, if you're just watching this at home or wherever, I hope if you're skeptical at all that you'll just listen for about the next 20 minutes and you'll hear some reasons why we believe that Jesus is alive. Here's the bottom line. If the resurrection were done with smoke and mirrors, then Jesus would still be dead someplace, and someone would want to discredit Christianity, and all they'd have to do is to produce a body. Everything we stand for, everything that makes us different than any other religion in the world, is that we believe that Jesus Christ was killed, and yet he was raised from the dead. So really, we don't gather here today to celebrate Easter what we gather to celebrate today is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yeah, it's hard to understand. It's hard to grasp. Especially for those who weren't raised in homes where that was the belief. Or that's what was taught. You know, the skepticism, okay? Let's call it what it is. Skepticism surrounding Jesus being alive today started on the very Sunday after he was killed on a Friday. In fact, I want to read Luke's account in chapter 24 of his gospel of how, about what happened that first Easter morning or resurrection morning. And I want you to see if you can hear the skepticism, okay, that existed even amongst Jesus' own followers. Okay, turn with me to Luke chapter 24. We're going to begin in verse 1, and it says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in cloths that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. 
He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of the sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Reading on. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all of the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, mother of Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran into the tomb, and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Did you note in verse 11 where Luke says that they didn't believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense? And and Peter himself, one of Jesus' closest friends, went to the tomb, saw it himself, and he walked away wondering what's happening. Now, I'm sure they didn't use the term or even think of the term smoke and mirrors back in that day. But in their mind, it's the same idea. They were wondering, this doesn't make sense. How in the world does someone we saw who is dead come back to life? You know, the easiest thing to do in cases like that for people who deny, who are skeptical, is to just deny this whole event even happened. Even starting with Jesus' death on the cross, there are more than a few who say that that was just a hoax. The whole thing was just smoke and mirrors so that we would believe something about Jesus that wasn't really true. That we would believe that he really was divine, that he was the son of God, and not just another man. You know, if that's your thinking, if that's where your thinking lies this morning, then I just want to use a phrase, okay, that we've heard a lot in the last year. For those of you who are really skeptical about Jesus, I want you to just trust the science. I want you to trust the data. We've been told over and over again this past year to trust the scientific data that has been produced in regards to how serious the coronavirus is. And whether or not you do that, that's up to you. But you know what? There is more than overwhelming evidence scientifically proven that Jesus did walk on this earth, did amazing things that includes raising from the dead. And what makes it trustworthy is that it's not just Christians okay, who look at the evidence and who come to that conclusion. Take, for instance, a guy named Richard Swyburn, who was the chairman of the philosophy department at Oxford Oxford University for a number of years, okay? Highly respected, both academically and scholarly. Here's what he said. After reviewing all of the evidence and discussing all the probabilities, and on a strictly factual basis, I conclude there's a 97% chance that Jesus rose from the dead. (laughs) What would it take to get the other 3%? (laughs) Okay? 97%, sure, this is a guy who isn't a believer, but looked at all of the evidence and says, you know what, there's a 97% 97 chance this is right. Now, most of us would make a pretty good bet, okay, or a pretty good wager on something that somebody told us was 97% accurate. But for those who are more than 3% skeptical about Jesus' resurrection, there's two problems that you haven't been able to solve for a long time. In fact, since that first day. The problem, number one, is the tomb is still empty. It always has been. And number two, no one has been able to produce a body for over 2,000 years. And believe me, they've tried. There have been people who have tried to find the body of Jesus Christ. When they can't solve that problem, either of those problems, what do they do? They create their own smoke and mirrors. For instance, the story that we read in Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, talks about how even the very day that Jesus came back to life, the religious leaders started a story that was nothing really more than smoke and mirrors. Look at that story with me from Matthew chapter 28, verse 11. It says, while the women were on their way, Okay, while the women were on their way from the tomb, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were sleeping, which begs the question, why were you sleeping when you were working? But okay. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. 
So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story, okay, this smoke and mirror story has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. You know, in some circles, that's still the story they're sticking to, okay? Jesus' body was stolen by the disciples. That's what a lot of people want to say. But here's where science begins to break the mirrors of that story. You see, Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona are two contemporary Bible scholars who have focused most of their adult life on studying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, they are considered the leaders, okay? Habermas and Lacona, leaders in this area of study, and they suggest that there are multiple reasons, okay, for Jesus to, to show that Jesus... Jesus' body was not stolen by his disciples, and it can be validated through scientific principles that are used to, to credit or discredit almost anything. The first one they say is this, okay? They say that the enemy factor supports the idea that Jesus is indeed alive. Because they say in a town no bigger than Jerusalem was at that time, people knew what was going on. And if the body was still in the tomb, or if somebody had actually taken that body, they would not have done anything, they would not have stopped at any limit to go and find that body to discredit this movement before it got started. Because you see, once they produced that body, then Christianity would have been stopped dead in its tracks, even before it even started. But they couldn't do that. And... Don't you believe that the religious leaders who were so opposed to Jesus, his whole ministry here, would not have done everything within their power to try to produce this body if it really existed? Oftentimes, I think we also overlooked the role that the Roman leaders would have played in this. It's easy to see some of them as like Pilate and other people as simple pawns who were played by the religious leaders. But you know what? There's no doubt in my mind that they were closely watching what was going on. Because what they began to see was this movement of people, this ground dwelling of people. Because after 50 days, there were over 3,000 people who had made a public confession, a public admission that they were followers of this Jesus. So my guess is, the religious leaders were, or I'm sorry, the political leaders were paying very close attention to what was happening. In fact, it's Habermas who said that he, he was the one who made the connection between what the Apostle Paul said to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 26, okay, Paul is standing before the king and he's having to defend his self, his life, what he believes, and he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about Jesus coming back to life. And Festus, who is the governor of the area, just happens to be there. And he interrupts Paul. And he says, Paul, you're going crazy, buddy. Listen to Paul's response, okay? And who he's talking to here. Chapter 26, verse 25. Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. But I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows, okay, King Agrippa knows about all these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for he, this has not been done in a corner. So basically what Paul is saying here is that, King, there's no smoke and mirrors. This isn't a hoax. In fact, I'm so confident that you know all about this. Perhaps you even know more than I do, King. And then he goes on to say, wouldn't you like to become a follower? <laughs> Of Jesus today? And the king says, no. So he declines that, but he also declines to do something else, as Habermas points out. This would have been the perfect opportunity for the king, who knew all of this information, to look Paul in the eyes and say, you're wrong. Jesus isn't alive. But that's not what Agrippa did, was it? So I think even then, it shows that, and Habermas and Lycona like point out, that it was an accepted fact in the first century AD, that Jesus' tomb was empty and that Jesus must have arisen from the dead because no one could explain the empty tomb or the missing body. That's a pretty strong case, I think, in itself. We call that the enemy factor. But there's another argument 
that I think shows that the church isn't using smoke and mirrors. And, 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 and in regards to the commitment level amongst Jesus' followers that has been sustained to this very day. Think especially about those who were closest to Jesus and what they went through just because they believed in him. We read in the Bible about how Jesus appeared after his resurrection to different groups of people. Have you ever wondered why that was so important? I, I'm sure you realize it was, it was because he had to solidify in their minds that he truly was alive. See, once they could see him, once they could, some of them could touch him, there was no doubt. There was no denying that Jesus was alive. And that worked. And then we read about some of the people who came out of those groups like Stephen. Who was given a choice. Stephen, either deny Christ or die. And what did Stephen do? He chose death. And he wasn't the only one. Because you know, for one person to make that choice would say something. But for thousands and thousands of people to make that choice, I think speaks not only to the level of commitment of Christ's followers, but to the of what they believed. I, I like how Chuck Wilson, the former advisor to President Nixon, used his life to help explain the resurrection. For those of you who are younger and who don't have an idea who Chuck Colson is, okay, uh, he was uh, one of President Nixon's closest advisors. He was deeply involved in what was known as the Watergate uh, scandal, and he spent some time in prison. Okay? And when we was, it was when he was in prison that he really began to investigate Jesus. And in fact, he became a follower of Christ. And one of his, you know, I think largest uh, or, or biggest advocates and uh, evangelists for him. But I, I like this one comment <laughs> that I read from Colson. Uh, I'll show it to you. It says this. I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years. Never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it, wasn't, if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. <laughs> They're tell you're telling me the 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Human nature says this. We're not going to endure a lot of punishment, a lot of torture, or die for something that we don't think is true. But not only did the 12 of, closest, 12 of Jesus' closest followers proclaim for 40 years the same message. They died because of that message. In fact, for years, over the years, millions of people have died because of what they believed. Just think about it this way. If at some point enough people began to deny that what we believed was true, if enough people walked away from that belief, sooner or later it would be revealed that, hey, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all a hoax. It's all fake. But that hasn't happened. Christianity continues to grow and to expand. Why? Because it's true. You know, that's what's happened in the empty tomb and the commitment of Jesus' followers, I think, support this idea. But there's one more reason that I think is even stronger than those. And it's the hope that I see in my life and that I see in other people's lives who know that Jesus rose from the dead. You've heard a couple of us complete uh, the sentence this morning, there's no denying that Jesus is alive because. I really want you to wrestle with that question in your own mind and be able to articulate that maybe as you leave the building today. Why is it that you believe that Jesus is alive? And if you don't yet, that's fine. That's fine. But can you wrestle with that question anyway? Here's what I know to be true. I know a lot of people who have left a lifestyle that they knew one day was going to lead to self-destruction. Perhaps it was alcohol, perhaps it was drugs, perhaps it was some other path that they were on that they thought was going to bring them happiness. 
but ended up only bringing a lot more pain and suffering. The consequences to those choices can be devastating. We all know that. We all know people who've gone through that. But fortunately for many of you who are listening to this, you have believed that there's hope beyond those circumstances because Jesus is alive. If you've been in my office here at the church, you may have noticed this picture, okay, that hangs in my, or sits in my office. And it, it, what's unique about this picture is it changes whatever angle you look at it. I don't know what you call it. I call it pretty neat, okay? Um, different scenes from Jesus' life, him hanging on the cross, him as the shepherd, uh, the Lord's Supper, you know, the, the Last Supper, all those things. This is a very special picture for me, not because of necessarily what it is, but because of who gave it to me. It was given to me by a guy by the name of Joe Welch. I, I met Joe first a few years ago uh, when I was at Hope, and um, he had just gotten out of jail and uh, had been dealing with a lot of uh, life issues based upon that criminal past and relationship failures and, and all kinds of stuff. And um, he just came and we started talking. We talked a lot. And eventually we started talking about how, Joe, you know what? There's hope for you to get through this if you fully embrace that Jesus Christ is alive and that he becomes the most important thing in your life. I'm happy to say that's what Joe did. I remember him calling me one day and he goes, Dave, I'm moving to Texas. I said, whoa, good. <laughs> I'm moving to Texas. I got something I want to give you. And it was a picture. But you know what? It's this note that came with this picture that means far more to me. Because in it, he just shared about the hope that he found in Jesus Christ. You know what? This morning, you may be one of those people who are skeptical about whether or not Jesus is alive. And you may be thinking, you know what? What if it was smoke and mirrors? What if it was all fake? That's okay. My hope and my prayer, though, is that you're willing to at least investigate the evidence. Look at the data. Trust the science, the social sciences that have investigated this for centuries. That has people who are very, very intelligent, who don't come from a Christian background, saying, there's a very high chance that Jesus Christ truly did raise from the dead. Are we all willing to think about that this morning? Because I think if we are, it's going to only enhance our faith. It's only going to make us stronger. Can we come to the point where we will say that there's no denying that Jesus Christ is alive and that he's involved in my life? It really comes down to one thing. It comes down to do we believe that Jesus is alive or is he dead? Lee Strobel wrote a series of books called The Case for Christ, The Case for the Resurrection, and that kind of stuff. He makes one statement that I want to kind of close with this morning that I want you to think about. In The Case for the Resurrection, he says this, It didn't take long for me to conclude that the truth or falsity of all world religions and the ultimate meaning of life itself comes down to just one key issue. Did Jesus, or did he not, return from the dead? The answer to that fundamental question would settle everything. My hope and prayer is that you've settled that question in your life. If you haven't, whenever you listen to this, if you're hearing it today, today is the best day to make that decision and to publicly proclaim. There's no doubt. There's no denying in my mind that Jesus is alive and my Lord and Savior. If you're watching this on the live stream and you want to make that confession or that, that commitment, just message us. We'll get back to you. If you're here and you want to do that, the worship team is going to come and they're going to sing a song after I pray. And you know what? Just let us know that that's the direction you want to go. And we'll be glad to talk with you and help you take whatever steps possible to come to that point in your life. I really look forward to having a lot of those conversations with a lot of people in the next few weeks. Let me pray. Father God, there's just so much to be joyful about today. 
Father, we know that um, a lot of people observe this day. A lot of people celebrate Easter, but not a lot of people really know or believe that Jesus really did die and come back to life. And God, it is hard. I, I wrestle with that sometimes myself. And then I allow your spirit and I allow the, the facts and the knowledge and the information that is out there. And God, when I look at it, God, there's no doubt. And just what you've done in my life and the lives of people that I know, God, I can't deny that your son Jesus not only died for us, but he lives today for us. So God, may we follow in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And God, I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. There's no denying that Jesus is alive because in the hardest times, in the darkest seasons, when there was no way that I was going to make it through by myself, I know that he was there carrying me. For me, there's no denying that Jesus is alive today because I feel his spirit. So many times, there have been times when I needed the right words or the right actions, and I didn't know what to do. But I had the, the nudging of the Spirit. And when I follow those nudgings, I know what to do. There's no denying that Jesus is alive today.
this morning as I was thinking again about communion time, looking to the east at the, at the sun and the clear sky, um, my thoughts uh, turned to communion about 30 years ago. I guess that's one of the benefits of a few decades of experience as you you get to reflect over the decades. It was the, it was the final communion that Shirley and I celebrated in Liberia, ever. Civil War was just down the road, about uh, 12, maybe 15 miles away. An unseen threat that we knew was deadly. It had prevented churches from meeting together and so we were not able to celebrate with fellow believers as we were accustomed. But there was a missionary couple just down the road from us to the south about uh, maybe three or four hundred yards, not far. And so we went to their house on that Sunday morning for Easter we had breakfast with them, um, a meal, and we celebrated communion on their, on their front porch facing the east, the sun bright, clear day, no sound of gunfire, just the thought of, of hope and confidence in the midst of all that could be thrown at our world. I'd like to read for you uh, this morning from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, because I think that the Apostle John was also thinking of a Last Supper, a communion time, maybe 40, 50, maybe 60 years before this time. And he began it by saying, in, by writing in that first verse of chapter 2, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Wow, how he remembered that it was sin that took his best friend and his savior and his king to his death. He knew the power of sin. And he prayed and he hoped and he encouraged and he wrote, I hope that you do not sin. But if you do, if anyone sins, he says, we have an advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, gave us. We have an advocate in Jesus. We have an advocate to, to come with us before the righteous Father, our judge. And verse 2. He's the propitiation. Kind of an unusual word for us. Let's, for today's purposes, just say he's our sacrifice. The sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that, folks, friends, that, that's why we are here. That's why we are here celebrating this communion time. That's, that's why Shirley and I gathered with Wayne and Greta Meese on their front porch 30 years ago in the midst of war. That's why we are here together at this time. That's what brings us together, really. Really. That we can celebrate that Jesus died for our sins. Yes, we hope that we don't sin, but if we do, 
Jesus is our advocate. He's our sacrifice. He's, he makes us right before God and with God. Not just us, but Jesus died for the world. Um, this morning we have two cups. <laughs> one has a piece of bread, and one some juice. And if Jesus is your Lord, Savior, as he is mine, we invite you to take the bread and, and I will pray and we will eat it and remember that in doing so, we are remembering Jesus' broken body, broken for us. Shall we pray? Lord, we, we take this bread, we eat it, and remember that Jesus suffered for us. He, he did indeed, in reality, in all truth, suffer for us, unworthy as we are. And so we, we thank you for for giving your son, for his, his willingness to go to the cross for us. And so we take and eat. And then take the cup with the juice. And I will pray and we'll drink together. Lord, we... We thank you for the new, renewed relationship that we have with you. Only, only one thing makes that possible. And that's the death of Jesus, his death for us, that we may have life. And so today we celebrate that life together on this Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate what you gave that we might live. Not only us, but all creation, the whole world. As we together look forward to Jesus coming again. Amen.
the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Thank you again for joining with us today. And if you're uh, visiting with us for the first time, uh, we're just glad that you chose and we're honored that you chose to worship with us on this, the most spectacular day of the whole year. So uh, just a couple quick announcements. There's not going to be any youth group tonight, so uh, uh, junior high and high schoolers can stay home uh, with family and celebrate whatever you want to do there and uh, have a lot of fun. Uh, also, I want to just kind of give a little tease for the next message series that we're going to start next week. It's going to be out of the Old Testament book of Amos, okay? Mm. Uh, you may have to look in your little content things to find Amos, but it's there, okay? And uh, I think, yeah, I would invite you to start reading through it, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to see the parallels between some of the things that the people back in those days were dealing with when it comes to like social issues and social justice and, and the poor and, and how different groups were fighting amongst each other. And wow, uh, it just comes, kind of comes to life, I think, in what we're experiencing a lot today. So uh, dig into the Old Testament book of Amos. And uh, we'll be there for a few weeks. And uh, then if you want to get a preview of what's coming during the summer, jump to Job. Okay? <laughs> It'll take a little while longer uh, to get through Job. Uh, but um, uh, we'll spend some time in the Old Testament just kind of really uh, sensing what God was doing in the lives of the Israelites uh, before Christ even came uh, here on the earth. So, again, thank you. One last thing that we want to do, okay, is we want to, to send you out uh, today with just a, a song that hopefully will stick with you. Okay, uh, for the rest of this week. Uh, it's called Glorious Day. And uh, the words are going to be on the screen. And it's going to be a, a song that we're just going to ask you to sing with as you get more accustomed with it. Sing louder. If you'd like to dance and move, uh, please do that as well. Okay. But to do that, you've got to stand. Okay. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And then I'm going to pray. And then hopefully you're going to dance. <laughs> Let's pray. God, thank you for today. God, every week we are blessed to be able to come and to worship freely and openly. But today, God, it's just special. Because today is the day we remember that you conquered death, that Jesus is alive, and there's hope for all of us, for all of eternity. God, may we go with that feeling today and that knowledge and God, may it be a glorious, glorious day. Amen. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame.